The Charles River Museum's Tuesday Tech Talk series is made possible by a grant from the Lowell Institute and by the support of our museum members. To become a member, visit charlesrivermuseum.org slash join. To follow us here on YouTube, click subscribe and hit like if you enjoyed this video. Me too. Thank you very much. Enjoy. <laughs> well, hello everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you very much for the, uh, thank you for the Charles Riverview Museum for having me. Uh, tonight I'm excited to share a photography process that I love and have practiced for the past 10 years, known as wet plate collodion photography. So there are so many responsible for, for the discoveries that led up to the uh, invention of the wet plate collodion process. From Schultz to Niepce, Wedgwood, Herschel, and Talbot, just to name a few. Frederick Scott Archer, the father and inventor of the wet plate collodion process, stood on the shoulders of these giants. Frederick Scott Archer, he was the son of a farmer born in Hertfordshire in the United Kingdom. He trained as a sculpture at the Royal Academy schools, and he found the calotype process of a useful way of capturing images of his sculptures. A calotype is a process that was invented by Henry Fox Talbot and creates a paper negative. Uh, dissatisfied with the poor definition of a calotype, Archer invented the wet plate collodion process in 1848, and in 1851 he published it in the chemist's publication. This new process was much faster than the calotype, reducing not only the exposure times to seconds, but it also had a lot more detail as well because it was using uh, glass. So wet plate collodion negatives could be made used for contact printing purposes and the duplication of images onto paper. The term wet plate refers to the fact that the photographic plate must stay wet while being prepared and processed. The plate is actually wet when it's shot in the camera, as you'll see later on tonight. And the term collodion refers to the photographic emulsion that is used to coat the plate. Glass negatives were basically first created by Archer. The process it's pretty much the same for tin types and also amber types as well. The only difference with glass negatives are that they are actually exposed for longer and also developed for a longer period of time as well. So the longer exposure you, you take, the more information you're going to get in an image, and the longer development is going to give you more density on the plate. The glass negatives are also used for duplicating the image onto paper. And in the glass negative, the highlights of the image appear as a layer of silver. The half tones vary in density depending upon development times, and the darker parts of the image have no information appear as void or clear spots. To reproduce this image on paper as a positive contact print, uh, a frame would be used with, for instance, a salt print process. So to do that, you'd use uh, a piece of paper, you would sensitize it with salt water and also with silver. You'd put it inside a contact frame, and I have one down here on the table I can show you. Um, and then you put the glass negative up against the piece of paper, and then you expose it outside in daylight for you know, a couple of minutes. It just depends on how much light there is outside. Um, and then what's going to happen is the layers of silver highlights that are on the glass plate, they're going to block the light. And the void, they're gonna, the void's going to let the light go right through and shine right on, onto the paper unrestricted, and it's going to produce the inverse of the image. So basically. This is a glass negative that I made of Yosemite Falls. And it's a lot more, um, it's intensified because I wanted to create more tone uh, to enable me to do printing. Um, and I was able to make this uh, collodion chloride print from that negative there, basically. So it took me to go to Yosemite to take that. Uh, and I. This is Yosemite, Yosemite Falls, yeah. So that's an example of a negative. Um, with this in the darkroom, I just used uh, UV lights and a couple of very heavy pieces of glass, and I sandwiched 
basically the glass negative with the paper and made sure it was tight contact to get a nice clear print. Now, you would be able to get these earlier on um, and basically there's a picture of a, or a negative of a watch in here and I basically made this print again using a frame very much like this. So this has a spring loaded back and inside is the paper. So this paper had a colluding chloride poured on it and I put the negative in here, dropped the paper on top of there and then I put the back in like this and keep it face up in the daylight, preferably a shady area, not direct sunlight. And I believe that was a four minute exposure that I, that I took here. Um, and one of the nice things about using a contact printing frame is you can open up the little flap on the back and take a look at the exposure and see how far it's got without actually moving the paper because if you were to move the paper then you get a double exposure basically. So that, that, uh, that's uh, glass plate negatives. So uh, let's get on to what is a tintype. Well, a tintype is also known as a ferrotype and basically what it is, it's a piece of tin that's been japanned using asphaltum, pretty much very similar to what you'd uh, use building roads here. And uh, that is actually baked onto the piece of tin um, to give it a black surface. Now the tin plate provides support for the collodion, which is a photographic emulsion. And also the black surface of the plate allows us to see the positive image as well. If we didn't, if we didn't see it uh, with a blackened back, um, it would appear clear and you would just see the negative. So by having a black back, you're actually seeing the positive version of the, of the image. Um, tin types became popular and less expensive and a less dangerous alternative to daguerreotypes, which was another uh, photographic process from Paris, which are very incredibly beautiful, but very dangerous to make and uh, you know very rare. Um, but I think this became more of a mainstream, you know, photographic technology of, of the time. Um, and I believe the ferrotype or tin type was first described in 1853 by Adolf Alexandre Martin. So. I've got a few original tin types here. Some of these are quite fun. Um, I did the big one here. So this literally is an original. You can see where someone with a brush had brushed on the asphaltum, and that's the back, that's the front. Um, it probably took several hours to make and bake these in an in a oven. Um, so different sizes. Um, this one I quite like, it's called a gem type. It was made with a very small lens and, and uh, I believe they made them on sheets um, with arrays of lenses basically, uh, but it's very nice. Did they use those in like, you know those glasses with hair in there where you can sh uh, see scenes, you know, that was really popular with the green pictures, you click the button and then you're there. It's, it's possibly like a magic lantern or... Yeah, like, you know, you put it up to your eyes and then... You, see you mean like a stereograph? Yeah, um, they'd probably be a bit bigger than that. Probably, yeah, maybe more. I think actually they were like five by eight, those size plates, and then they would have two images, one on each side, basically. Yeah, and you'd put them in the viewer and kind of focus on it. You know, a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. Was different, though. yeah, this is different. This is just called a gem type, and you know, I think typically people would make jewelry of their loved ones and you know lockets and that sort of thing. Uh, but it's just a very nice little thing, you know. Um, and then. Ambrotypes. So ambrotypes are basically using exactly the same process. Um, the glass is used for us as a support for the chemistry, and you can either put it on colored glass or clear glass. Um, if you were to put it on clear glass again, um, you could uh, use a sphaltum on the back of the glass to, to get the, the black and, um, background, or um, a lot of the time they would be put inside cases with black velvet again so you can see the image, positive image going through there. And, you know, no doubt Archie would have made the very first ambrotypes, um, but someone actually did patent uh, the ambrotype, James Ambrose Cutting in 1854. So, here's actually an ambrotype that I made. 
me if I turn the light, you can see it's glass. See, it's quite nice. That's a negative right there. Or well, that's actually a positive when I turn the light off, but because there's such a strong light behind it. See. <laughs> um, I actually have, I love this one. The case on this is beautiful. Um, that's amber type with black velvet on the back. Absolutely exquisite. I love the way that they made the boxes and the, the, the borders and everything, the velvet. Very, very nice. Um, they put, you know, I think this one, yeah, this one has a little rouge on the cheeks, that sort of thing, you know. But uh, very nice objects, and you can still find them if you, if you look for them. Sure. Where did you come across this particular? This one? Oh, I bought it from a dealer. <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have a, a small collection. It's hard to decide really what to bring, you know. I actually do have an Abraham Lincoln at home that was made by um, someone in Philadelphia. Yeah. It was a copy of, I think, one that Brady had taken, but, and it was made on a replicating camera. Um, but yeah, I was like, it's lovely to, to get that, <laughs> you know. But I like unusual tin types and amber types, quite fun. Okay, so let's have a look at, uh, the, well, let's dissect a wet plate and the, the different layers that, that are on them. So um, as we've just been explaining, you have the substratum, they call it, it's the the, um, the bottom layer that holds the emulsion, so this can either be tin or glass, essentially. Something that won't react with silver nitrate. Um, I think people actually use plexiglass as well, um, so that's another option today. Um, so that's your bottom layer. On top of that is the middle layer, and this is where the actual photograph is going to live. Um, this is the collodion layer, and the collodion actually has salts that are dissolved within it. And once introduced to silver nitrate, it produces something called a silver halide. And these are the key to the wet plate collodion process. And then on top of that, we get a nice layer of varnish um, made from gum sanderac and al alcohol and lavender oil as well, which acts as a, a plasticizer um, to provide a protective layer from oxidization and from small uh, scratches as well. Um, so that's, uh, I, I use that. It's something that was invented during the American Civil War and um, has a little sort of amber tone to it. Some people like it, some people don't. Um, some people use more modern varnishes like Liquitex and things like that, but um, we know that the um, gum sanderate is definitely the most archival of all the varnishes out there because we still have the images from 1850. Um, but there's no guarantee by using something like Liquitex your image is going to last. You know, so I think that's quite important. You know, it's, it's such a, an amazing archival process. You know, you want to you stick to the recipe as best you can, so that way you know, you know, your images are going to be, hopefully, still in existence hundreds of years from now, which is quite a nice thought, really, I think. So I want to just talk about four different photographers that are like, um, just briefly, who would be using this process back in the 1850s. Um, so Julia Margaret Cameron, absolutely incredible photographer. Um, she made beautiful portraits of Alice uh, Liddell, who was the inspiration for Alice's adventures in Wonderland. Um, she also captured Charles Darwin and Longfellow, just to name a few. Um, but I just think it's incredible the way she used light and the way she captured uh, these famous people. Also, the famous Nadar Gaspard Felix Turner of Paris. He was, a, again, a true master of using natural light in portraiture, very famous. Um, he, he photographed so many people, including uh, Alexandre Demar and Claude Debussy, the composer. Um, but also, very importantly, he was the very first person to take aerial photography from, from a balloon above the streets of Paris as well. So he was quite a character, I believe. Um, and then moving on to um, landscape photography, uh, I, I really like Timothy O'Sullivan. You know, he was a photographer and also a surveyor as well. Um, and he famously photographed plates of the American Civil War and was also a pioneer of geophotography. And he was pretty much the first person to take photography out of the portrait studios and into the field. And lastly, uh, Carlton Watkins, um, one of my favorites. He is considered one of the greatest photographers of the, the American West. 
is very famous for making mammoth-sized plates on site, which is an amazing achievement considering the difficulties that he faced. Um, and he created a very large body of, of these mammoth plates that included um, a lot on Yosemite, and some say actually influenced Congress to designate the area as a national park as a result. Um, and you know, to me, Watkins uh, Yosemite plates are so inspiring to me, and they've definitely influenced my landscape photography. So if you ever get a chance to, to see them, it's, it's well worth it. So how much equipment do we need uh, to do this process out in the field or anywhere? I mean, you can see what I've had to bring today, but it's, pre it's pretty much a truck load. Um, this, is, <laughs> this is a picture of my truck, um, my 12 by 20 uh, camera, old banquet camera that I use as a landscape camera. It's almost the perfect ratio. And um, it literally, yeah, I filled a truck bed with everything I needed to go out west and, and take plates. Um, so you have to really want to do this. <laughs> so yeah, to start with, most practitioners, they're going to be using a large format view camera. And there are, you know, there are different types out there. Um, so this one is a lightweight Chamonix camera. Um, and I've, I use that a lot when I travel. Um, I can't take these kind of cameras out with me. It's just, you know, it's just a non-starter. Um, and I will use stuff like um, carbon fiber legs so I can walk to different locations. Sometimes it's, it's quite a, a trek. Um, and then, of course, there's these big heavy studio uh, cameras that you know, move around on wheels, that sort of thing is what I was able to bring tonight. And this one up here is actually a Century Master Studio camera from around about the 1930s and still does a great job. A absolutely wonderful piece of machinery. Um, very well made, very robust, very sturdy. Um, and very accurate as well, um, surprisingly. So, so yeah. Um, and I will normally shoot eight by ten inch plates, um, but I also offer eleven by fourteen and also sixteen by twenty uh, mammoth plates in my studio. Um, the mammoth plates definitely you, you need to be using a studio. I, I feel, um, and they're very challenging to make, but again, equally rewarding as well when you make them well. So when using a large format camera, the world is viewed usually under a focusing cloth to block out the reflected light. And um, the world through a large format camera is upside down and backwards. Um, modern cameras have mirrors in them, so you don't see it in that way. But it takes a little bit of getting used to um, when you start doing this. And equally important is a very good lens that's going to cover the entire image. And again, many, many different kinds of lenses. Um, the more popular ones are called Petzwell uh, lenses, and they're known for their um, you know, sort of crystal clear in the middle and then the sort of swirly bokeh. This one has a little bit, but there are other lenses like Dalmeyer's where you get extreme sort of bokeh. If you were to take, for instance, a picture outside um, of trees, bushes, that sort of thing, they very, they're very, very swirly. Um, a nice effect if you like that kind of thing. Um, then, of course, you've got rectilinear lenses, which are used more for landscape and architecture because they provide straight lines, they're clear, and they don't, um, they've pretty much got zero distortion. Um, so those, are those sorts of lenses. Um, and then the dark box, again, that's, that's equally important. Um, so you know, this is ancient dark box, and this is my answer to that, an Eskimo fishing tent. <laughs> um, so I pack that up, take that with me, in the middle of nowhere, set that up, and that basically becomes the dark tent. I zip myself in. Um, it gets very hot in there, especially in Death Valley, um, <laughs> places like that. Um, so you're in and out pretty quick. Um, so why do you so, have to go into the tent? Well, because um, basically when you sensitize the plate, um, you have to be able to work with it. So um, the moment it comes out of the silver nitrate bath, it's light sensitive. And if you have any white light, it's going to immediately expose. So having it inside the tent in red light conditions, that enables me to load it into a camera back, take it to the camera, take my shot, come back, do my development. And then at a certain point in the process, you can take it out after development, and it's been stopped to come outside, and you can watch it um, fix, which is quite a fun, fun moment. And you'll be able to see that tonight as well. Um, so there's that, you, you've got these kind of tents, but then another option that, that I've used is um, pretty much what you, this, this box has been round everywhere. It slips right for years, um, still going strong, a few repairs here and there.
but um, it slips right into the back of my truck. Um, and I can close the truck and drive off and find a great spot to shoot, open the truck up, and I'm up and running pretty quickly. Um, there's baskets inside and roller towel, and everything is there where I need it. Um, so that's, that's a good option, too, because the problem with the tent, of course, is you've got to pop the tent up, and then you have to unload everything and, and organize your workflow inside the tent. And, you know, unless you're doing really big plates. Um, I mean, w with this size, I'm kind of limited to about 8 by 10. Um, anything bigger, um, yeah, you'd have to use the tent because you have to be very careful. Silver nitrate can blind you. And you want to you keep your eyes away from, from that silver tank. Little specks can come up, you, don't, you know, just by pure accident. So, um, you know, if you want to use large, I have a 12 by 20 bath for that other camera I was showing you. Um, I could never use it in there. I don't, you know, you need the, the height as well to pull the paddle. There's like a, a ladle inside, so you need the height to pull the, the paddle out to get the plate into the bath. Um, so, so yeah, but this for 8, 10, 4, 5, fantastic. Really good, good uh, solution, I, I, would, I would say. And um, in addition to this, of course, there's a multitude of chemicals, bottles, trays, water, waste containers, you name it. Um, and a checklist is really essential to ensure that you don't forget anything, because if you do, you, know, you may as well go home. You know, and that's, that's a sad fact. Okay, so let's talk about the chemistry. What are the chemical components that go into this process? So let's start with collodion. So what is collodion? Well, it's, it's basically this stuff in this bottle here. Um, it's kind of weird stuff. Um, it's basically made from um, cotton wool dissolved in sulfuric acid, nitric acid, and then combined with ether, alcohol. And then from there, I dissolve salts inside of it too. Um, but uh, what you'll find with collodion is um, you'll open up its liquid form, but once you pour it onto a surface and it hits the air, it starts to set up almost like, I don't know, like a saran wrap, I guess you would say. Um, and the, it's important to get it into the silver bath so you can get that chemical reaction um, at the right time. If you, if you put it in too early, uh, you know, you're going to ruin your silver bath and you're going to have to do maintenance on that. If you put it in too late, well, you're just not going to get a very good image from it at all. Um, so, but this is pretty much the basis of, of this process. Um, and I believe this was actually used uh, in the Civil War as a liquid skin. It was like the very first liquid skin. And of course it's used in movie um, uh, makeup and that sort of thing. There's a weird substance. So we mix up salts with the collodion. We mix up a bromide and we mix up an iodide. Um, and the collodion itself actually acts as a carrier for these salts um, and covers the entire plate with the salts. Um, and there are many recipes that you can use. Um, I choose to use a couple of them. One is old workhorse, they call it, and that is a cadmium bromide and potassium iodide um, uh, recipe. And it creates a long-lasting collodion. Now, typically, I'll make that collodion. It'll probably last me about 12 months, which, which is great. Um, but the problem with that is, the downside I should say with that is, um, you know, it's not something you can mix and use immediately. I'd have to mix it and maybe leave it for about a week because it's very cloudy in the beginning. You have to wait for, um, you know, the salts to settle down, down the bottom of the collodion before you can really start using it. Um, and then, you know, you have choices like lithium bromide, which I think is, it does speed up the collodion just, just a smidge. Um, you know, if, you, if you've got a slower lens, for instance, or you, you know, you're going to be working in slightly lower light conditions than normal, um, you could go for a lithium bromide uh, recipe. And um, the problem with it, though, is that, yes, you can use it immediately, but the aging process of that collodion starts right away, and it's, you know, probably within a couple of months, it's no good, and you have to throw it away. So if you're going to use that, generally, I would mix up a very small batch of it. Yes? Okay. Uh, about a Danish priest, maybe around the 1850s, um, who was, uh, I don't need to tell you the whole plot of the movie, but he was using, I think, glass plates and photography. Uh, he went to Iceland. Well, it's fiction, a fictional movie, but they, they actually found the book plates. Oh, wow. And the movie was built. Anyway, they showed him using egg whites. Yes. On the surface of the glass. So yeah. The yeah, so, so when you're making um, an ambrotype, you might want to use 
um, egg white around the edge of the plate because what tends to happen is once it goes in the water, the collodion starts to lift from the plate. And you know, there's a bit of agitation that goes on in the process. So you know, your liquid's swishing, swishing about. And once it gets up that collodion, it can flap over and lie back on itself. And then you know, <laughs> you gotta get some tweezers and try and you know, tease that back. And it's a pain, once it's lifted, it's, it's hard. You know, until it's dry, dry. Yeah, so for that, but also, if you wanted to make a glass, that, that glass made there, um, I flow the entire glass plate with egg albumin, basically. So, you, you know, when you're prepping that stuff, um, you've really got to keep the glass clean, and, you know, you can do that a number of ways, but you don't, you don't use any modern cleaning products like Windex or anything like that. You just can't, because you're, you're going to start introducing other chemistry into this chemistry, and then before you know it, you're going to have fog and all sorts of issues. So, with the glass negatives, the way I was taught was, yeah, absolutely, you flow the entire plate so it's all the same color, because what you'll see is on an ambrotype, you can see around the edges because it's a slightly different color. Um, but if you flow the entire negative, then it's all one uniform color, um, and it's never going to peel off, you know, unless you get hot water on it and scrub it, you know. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the difference. Hello. Would you explain, is, is the, uh, the albumin a alternative to collodion? Like, one or the other, or are they, like, different elements? Well, there, I understand there are other processes where you could mix silver with albumin. I've not done it um, as an alternative to collodion. Um, but I've not really done that before. Um, but I use it together, basically, um, and literally just use the album just so it adheres to the glass much, much better. You know, that, that's the reason why. Mike, For me. Mm -hmm. There are a few of the processes for making prints. For making what? Prince. Oh, prints? Yes, that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's, that's different. something I've not really experimented with, um, so I can't really talk too much to that. Um, so what is the speed of ISO of salted collodion? Well, it's actually 0.3 of an ISO, which is pretty slow compared to film and to modern cameras. And you know, digital modern cameras can go up into the hundreds of thousands of ISO. So we can't change the speed. All we can really do is uh, use a faster lens, use more light, or take a longer exposure. I mean, it's just as simple as that, really. Um, so when you first mix up collodion, it starts off as kind of like a, a yellow sort of straw color. And as it starts to age, it turns a nice orange until it finally in, ends into a deep yellow kind of red. And that's when you know it's time to toss it. Also, the uh, consistency of it too, it's, um, it does change from almost like a molasses kind of feel to more of a kind of watery feel. So you want to have the, the nice thing about it is when it's that kind of molasses feel, um, it's easier to control when you pour it on the plate and you kind of move around. And I'll pour a collodion plate so you can watch me do it and um, you'll see, see uh, what goes into that. So we've got our collodion, we've got our salts which are dissolved in the collodion and the third thing we need is silver nitrate. So basically, um, and this is something that Schultz discovered was that um, you know, salt reacts with silver nitrate and um, basically it creates something called silver halides, um, and that's what basically makes this work. Um, once the reaction has taken place with the silver and the salts, um, it must be handled under red light conditions um, because it's actually ready to be exposed in the camera. So we expose it in the camera, and then we use uh, a developer um, and once you pour the development or developer on uh, the plate, what's going to happen is any of the areas of reflected white light that came back from, um, from what you were taking during the exposure, um, the silver halides are going to be reactive to. And when the developer hits those silver halides that had those reflected white pieces of light on them, they're going to convert to metallic silver. Um, so that's, that's basically what you're seeing on, on these plates, on these negatives, that is basically metallic silver, where all the highlights were. The void is where there was no information, it's clear to see through, there's nothing there, no reaction took place on that, partic place on that particular part of the plate. Um, so after, after we developed it, and we're happy with how far the development's gone, we're gonna stop this reaction with water, just plain old water, and then 
we're going to fix the plate. Um, so basically, um, potassium cyanide was the original fixer. And I don't have any with me tonight because I don't wish to kill anyone. Um, so I use ammonia thiosulfate as an alternative. And you can also use sodium um, thiosulfate as well. But I quite like um, the ammonia thiosulfate because it fixes really quickly, um, almost as fast as potassium cyanide. Um, and the sodium just takes a bit longer. It's a bit, you know, doesn't, doesn't give you that sort of wow factor, I guess you'd say. Um, so what the fixer does, it, it removes all the remaining silver halides that are still kind of reactive to light, but they weren't converted by the metallic, uh, to metallic silver by the developer. And it fixes the image so it no longer develops, so you can take it outside and, and enjoy it up on the wall, and it's not going to continue to develop and then go, go black on you basically disappear. So let's walk through the process real quick. So basically, you prepare your, your glass or your tin. Um, so with the tin, I'll show you what I use. So this stuff is basically aluminum. It's not really tin. Um, and it, it comes from a, a trophy supply place in Chicago. So if you ever won an award and you're going to have your name engraved, well, this is the material they would use. The, the really great thing is about this is it's good for wet plate because it actually has a, um, a plastic film over the top of it, like a sheet, which means that I can just peel the sheet off and underneath it, there'll be a clean surface that I can put a photograph on without ha actually having to spend the time cleaning it. Um, but when I take it, I'll, I'll peel that off for you. Show you how that works. Um, yeah, because it's it's hard to find tin. It could, you could find old tin cans or old oil cans or cookie tins, that sort of thing. But then you'd have to actually go to the trouble of japanning them and baking them in the oven. And they do look good when, if you do that. And uh, it just takes a long, long time. Um, that just saves you time. Mm -hmm. What's japanning? Japanning, it's like. Um, it's like uh, you're, you're blackening the, the material, basically. So you're using something, um, they call it asphaltum, and it's bit, I think it's like a bitumen that you get, you know, when you make uh, blacktop on the roads, you know, your driveway, that sort of thing. It's the, sa the same kind of thing. It's got mineral oil in, and uh, I think it's, what do they call it, Judea or bitumen, something like that. And um, you literally get a brush, and you, you brush the front of it where you want to take the picture. You bake it in an oven and you let it cool down, then you do another layer, do it again, until it's dense enough, and you know you, you've got a good foundation for, for tintype, basically. Um, it's rewarding, but it, again, it takes a lot of time. Um, this is just kind of, it's a shortcut, basically. Um, and I guess you could call them types, maybe. I don't know, I don't really know. <laughs> um, so, and with the glass, okay, so how I clean glass is I use chalk, and I use um, medical alcohol, basically. And I make like a, a paste, and I'll basically squirt it on the glass, and I'll rub the thing till it's literally squeaky clean on both sides. Um, I wear gloves so I don't get fingerprints on it, so that, that sort of thing. Um, I've actually used um, ash from fire. You know, the next day after having a nice log fire, you can use the ash, and that acts as a soft abrasion as well. So that, those are the two ways I know that are neutral to this process. And you know, you can you can use to clean the glass. But um, again, you know, it takes a lot longer to clean the glass than it does to get a piece of tin. And you know, but it depends what you're making. If you're making a negative, of course, you have to go through and spend the time cleaning cleaning your glass. Um, so now we've got a, a clean surface. What we're going to do is we're going to coat the plate. And what we do is we uh, pour a puddle in the middle of the plate, and we tilt the plate. And it's, it's all muscle memory, basically, but you tilt the plate a corner to corner, making sure you don't pull back on yourself. And you cover the entire plate and catch the excess back in, into the bottle, basically. Give it a little rock um, to make sure that the collodion sort of spreads out to the edges. And um, you've got a good pour, basically. Um, and yeah, you can do this in the, in the daylight. Um, and I'll, I, I can do this out here tonight. That's, that's not a problem. Um, because it's, it's only when it's introduced to silver, that's when, that's when you have to get under red light conditions. Um, 
So that usually, depending upon how hot it is, you know, if you're out in the desert, that thing's going to get set up real quick. And you have to get it in the silver bath right away. Um, to the, in here, what is it, in the 60s probably. So, you know, it would probably take maybe 20 seconds to start to set up. Uh, and usually what I do is I'll squeeze the, the edge of the plate just to see the consistency um, and see if I'm making um, an imprint on the side. And if I do, I think it's ready to go and I'll put it in the bath right away. Um, and basically, we get inside the dark box like this gentleman is here, um, and we'll put the plate in the silver bath. Um, one basically sweeps straight into the bath. If you stop halfway through, you can get these things called hesitation lines, which will leave a line right across your plate. So you sort of go halfway, stop, and then you go down. So if it gets caught on something, you'll get a, you'll get a nice line across that. You know, it kind of looks a little weird. Um, and they say it should be, be in the bath for about three to five minutes. Um, I don't, that, that really just, it varies, I think, basically on, again, the temperature, the humidity, those sorts of things. But as a general rule, around about three minutes. Um, I like to agitate when it's in the bath. So I'll get under that cloth there in the red light, and I'll, I'll just kind of move the ladle about just to kind of ag agitation, just to make sure that that, that reaction is, is happening all over the plate. And um, what I'm checking for is I'm looking at the surface of the plate and looking for um, the repulsion of silver from the front of the plate. What tends to happen is the collodion is going to be pushing against the silver. It doesn't want to absorb it. And you can see that because the plate has kind of got greasy lines on it. So you keep basically agitating. And um, once you pull it out, um, and it looks smooth, that's pretty much the time when it's ready. And you'll also, it'll, it'll go in, you know, like clear, but then it's going to turn to sort of like a white kind of gray color. Um, and that's when you know that reaction has actually taken place and it, it's ready to go. And at that point, you can put it inside your film holder and um, you can take your shot, basically. Um, so we've taken our shot, we take it back to the dark box, and now we've got to develop it. So generally speaking, 15 to 20 seconds to develop, um, depending upon the strength of your developer. Um, and basically, yeah, yeah, I mean, it happens fast, much faster than a lot of other processes. And what you'll generally see is the eyes come up first, the teeth of someone smiling, jewelry, anything that's got a shine to it, any sort of highlight. And what you want to do is look at basically the detail in the shadows. Um, if you overdevelop, you're going to lose that detail, and it's, you're going to get a flat image, basically. Um, and even worse, you're going to get fogging, too. So your blacks are going to turn gray, and that's when you know you've gone way too far with the developer. Um, so um, also heat can help with the development, too. Um, you know, if you're on the plate, too, a bit of heat will cause the reaction to, to happen as well. Um, so this is kind of what a wet plate looks when it's developed and it's ready to go in the fix. So you'll see it actually fixed, but that is the fixed image. So I've poured fixer on it, and I've washed away all the silver halides um, and to reveal the, the latent image basically underneath. Um, so once I've fixed it, I'm going to wash it. Um, I'm going to dry it and make sure it's bone dry. Um, and then I'll varnish it. And once it's varnished, it's good um, you know, for hundreds of years, hopefully. Um, you can remove varnish too. There are methods too if you make a mistake. Um, so it take, I think varnishing is, is a hard part of this whole process. To get a good varnish is it's hard, you know, because um, you know you're you're fighting against dust and all these kinds of other things that are out out there. So why do wet plate? You know, it can be difficult, time-consuming, expensive, technically challenging, very frustrating, and it always provides you with lessons. Um, <laughs> I think it's special because it is literally the most archival of all of the photographic processes. And like I was saying earlier, my plates are going to last hopefully at least another 170 years beyond me. Um, and it is a process that's UV sensitive, um, which, and it captures the world in a way that we don't see with our own eyes. And it, it has this sort of surreal, creative quality about it, um, which is very hard to recreate um, digitally. People have tried, but it's just you can tell right away. Um, and with a good lens, the detail can be spectacular, because we're not dealing with pixels here. We're dealing with atoms of silver. Um, 
And I mean, you look at the tapestry behind you there, that's, that was an eight by 10 and you know, that, that's what you can do. You walk up to that and you'll see the detail in that. It's, it's amazing, really, really good. Um, so each ta plate takes me about 30 minutes to process. So because of that, everything is slow and everything is very considered. Um, but it gives me time to enjoy the experience of actually taking that image. And you know, every piece is literally one of one. It's unique. And uh, you know, I can never take the same plate again because something will have changed. The way that I poured the chemistry on the plate, you know, the way that the sun moved outside, or you know, a whole number of different things. So you know, digital photography is amazing. It definitely has its place. But I also think it is a double-edged sword where it's very easy to make a lot of waste. And let's be honest, you know, how many images of the same subject does someone need? Is it one? Is it 10? Is it 100? You know? So the ability to make many photos a second is truly amazing, but you are left with the decision of which one of those 100 photographs you took is actually the right one. Um, and I'd much rather take my time and enjoy the experience of taking each image rather than sitting in front of a computer making those boring decisions, to be honest. Is it always reversed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the way uh, it, it comes out. Yeah, that's the way um, you see it in the view camera, and that's, that's what you'll see. If you were to take a glass negative, though, interestingly, if you, if you flip it around the other way, you see it the way that it was. You know. I think back, back in the Civil War, they, would, um, they knew this, obviously, so they would make their signs backwards. You know. <laughs> so quite, quite clever, yeah. But um, yeah, this is how it comes out, basically. Um, and it's a very rewarding process to be able to make a photo from scratch with raw chemistry. You know, if they ever kill film off, we've always got this. <laughs> this, is, this is great. Um, and also, you know, using this process, you do sometimes meet wonderful people along the way, randomly. Um, I had the chance to meet the angel of um, Route 66, Angel Del Gadillo. He is the ambassador and guardian angel of Route 66, the mother road that stretches from Chicago down to Santa Monica in California. And I don't know if you know the story, but after the construction of Interstate 70, Route 66, businesses were affected overnight, where virtually all the traffic had disappeared. Um, now, Angel is 96 years young, and he's still running a bike. And you know, he, he's taking it, you know, it's his job, basically, to bring this to the attention of the world. And he does it through TV interviews and um, you know, newspapers, all, all, all sorts of things. He's a very busy guy. And um, I don't know if you've seen the movie uh, cars, Pixar cars, but that, that was the backstory of, of Sigelman, basically. Um, so, I mean, it was really good to sit back, listen to the stories of old Route 66, and actually learn how the local communities are fighting to keep this important route alive. And, you know, Angel's a very popular man, very busy, but I was honored to take his wet plate and also to get a well earned haircut as well, because he's, he's a barber. <laughs> um, and also on my travels, I bumped into a guy, uh, Dave Chamberlain. Um, he's actually an ultra runner from South Africa who just randomly met on the side of the road in Capitol Reef in Utah. Um, and before I'd met Dave, he'd already run across South Africa, Canada, and he was on his third time running across the United States again, and he was gonna do it, another, he was gonna do it seven times. Um, so he basically ran a marathon every single day with all of his worldly possessions in that little buggy there. Um, raising money for his charity hug run. Um, so it was great to just relax him, you know, share the process with him, take his tin type, and you know, he took a really well-earned rest as well. So that was, that was kind of cool, you know. Um, so yeah, and another sort of part of my journey, um, I opened up a modern tin type studio in Lambertville, New Jersey, um, at the tail end of the pandemic. I, I felt like I really wanted to give give this a go on the high street and see whether you know, people come and have their portrait taken. Um, I don't know if you know Lambertville, but it's a small city by the Delaware River um, in New Jersey. It's really, it's a beautiful place. Um, and I create an environment for people to come and visit me, learn about the process, but also have their portraits taken as well. Um, you know, Lambertville is a small river city with a lot of beautiful buildings and a lot of history too. And the local community is a strong one, and the people that live and work there realize just how special a place it is. Um, so here's a few pictures of the outside of my shop. <laughs> me taking a few portraits, and me varnishing in the window. Um, so to honor this place and the people that gave it life, I actually uh, life, I, gave, I embarked on a project called, 
called Impermanence, which is kind of still ongoing. I'm still shooting. Um, so I wanted to capture the business owners and the shop fronts of Lambertville. Um, you know, these, these are the people that kind of uh, give the place life. Um, so I came up with a plan, and for each shop front, I basically make um, a metal tintype of the outside of the shop front um, without anyone in it. And I don't move the camera. I then take a second exposure, and I ask the shop owner to come in and stand in front of their store and maybe hold something that relates to what they do, what they sell, that sort of thing. And um, the glass that I have and I use is very special. It was given to me by the, by the local folk. And um, the glass actually comes from old um, shop fronts of Lambertville, old Victorian glass. And you can imagine people used to look through at things in the window, that sort of thing. And I kind of repurposed it, cleaned it up. And you know, I created, uh, there's a couple of images on the front here you, you'll be able to see a little later on. Um, so I've taken a few exposures. And I think what's interesting about the project is, you know, I stack these images together. So you've got the metal on the back, which has the building, and then the glass with the person in the front. And basically, when you view, you know, you're viewing through the very glass that people used to look through, uh, you know, to look through the, what was being sold in a shop. And, you know, it also acts as a reminder that, you know, we're only here for a short period of time before we disappear, and only the building actually remains. So, you know, not only do I enjoy close-up portraiture work, I also equally enjoy traveling and creating landscapes too. Um, and I pretty much bring landscapes home as a tangible piece of art. American landscapes to me are just so awe-inspiring. Um, they just seem very, very surreal. And, you know, when I'm standing there, I feel like I'm experiencing a dream, you know, pretty much where anything is possible. And it's the beauty and the wonder of these places that inspire me to continue my journey. The wet plate aesthetic, I feel, suits it well by giving it a dreamlike quality like no other medium can. And not only that, American landscapes, especially in the Southwest, give me a feeling of time just standing still. In most cases, landscapes haven't changed in the past 175 years when the wet plate was first invented, let alone the past you know, millions of years. Um, sh uh, shooting a uh, large Format also gives the landscape a, scale of, a sense of scale and captures incredible detail with minimal loss of clarity. And at the end of the day, I want the view of my photography to be drawn in by the landscape and to feel the same things that, that I do about it. Um, and I also feel a sense as if I've earned taking the image by all of the travel, the hiking, the research, the time, and the patient that goes, patience that goes into making each one of these images. And I also feel a deep respect and admiration you know, for the land, landscape itself. Um, and this grows during the time I'm working there, but also years to come when I'm still enjoying looking at the images that I've created. And of course, landscape photography has its challenges, such as weather, wind, elevation, temperatures, humidity, just to name a few. Um, one phenomenon that I learned about <laughs> in my travels was one called uh, atmospheric fog. Um, and the, the fog appears only in the wet plate collodion process um, when the air isn't clear. And it can't be seen by the human eye, and it can't be picked up by modern cameras, only by this particular process. Um, so landscape photographers in the 1800s knew about this, and they would actually wait for the perfect conditions for a wind to blow through um, and, you know, and plan for such things before capturing the shot. That literally could take days to get people like Timothy O'Sullivan, those, those sorts as well. Um, and there, was, there were two, two brothers, the Bierstadt brothers. One was a painter and one was a photographer back in the day. And um, you know, one of the brothers, he would be taking wet plates and coming up with the atmospheric fog. And his brother would actually paint atmospheric fog into the paintings, <laughs> which I always find kind of interesting. For works of art. So, um, so like a landscape has topology, so does a color print, which also has a three-dimensional quality of its own. Um, by creating wet plates, this has allowed me to duplicate my photography using some interesting processes, such as carbon printing. So carbon printing is a gelatin-based pro process that uses a dichromate instead of silver uh, to become sensitive to light. 
Um, basically, the animal gelatin has a color pigment added to it, usually black ink, but of course you can use any color that you like. Um, and I mean, when you look at this print of the, uh, of the watch, um, it, ha it literally has a relief to it. You could almost put a screwdriver in there or put in a key and wind that watch up. Um, it's just incredible to me um, what, what that actually looks like. So how did the wet plate die? <laughs> so of course, there was a lot of experimentation going on um, with you know, the need to eradicate trans transporting a dark box with you and all the equipment that goes with it. So um, there were people that were experimenting with dry plate collodion. Um, and I've done that myself. But the problem with it is the speed slows down even more. Um, my experiences with dry plate collodion are eight, nine second exposures in beautiful, bright sunlight. <laughs> so obviously, it's not good for, for portraiture work of any kind. Um, but in um, 1871, a gentleman called Richard Leach Maddox, he invented the gelatin dry plate process, which used animal gelatin, and actually became popular in the 18, um, in 1880 through the 1900s. Um, and this process really was the precursor to modern film. Essentially meant that the plates could be stored until a later date before shooting and then developed at a later time as well. Um, and I've always loved this, this picture here of uh, these gentlemen here on one side carrying all the tents and all the equipment. And then you've got the other two guys looking cool there. They just have a, a wooden box and a camera and that's all they need to capture what they want. Um, so I always thought that was, that was kind of cool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there was no darkroom uh, necessary um, when shooting dry plates. So that kind of changed things. And of course, um, George Eastman, he pushed the automation and manufacturing of dry plates. And by 1900, he went on to create an automated process uh, to create film, the brown camera, and a mail-based development service. And he changed the world. You push the button, and we do the rest. Welcome to the photography for the masses. And now we're going to do a live wet plate collodion demo. So, Caitlin, are you, are you my subject tonight? OK, come on in. So let me turn all the lights on, first of all. How's that? All right, match it. Okay, mind me. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, so everything's set up. I have a key light, two lights, an eye lighter. This thing's amazing. It just all the portraits I do. Um, so I don't know how many of you have used a, a large format camera. Perhaps you'd like to come around and have a look around the back. But um, you'll see from here, everything's upside down, back to front. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to come and have a look. Come, come on up. Don't be shy. It's OK. <laughs> So it's nice and dark here, but if it wasn't, we'd be using a, a dark cloth here to stop the reflections from the sides. Yeah, they call it an eye lighter, and uh, it reflects all the light from the, the top. It's going to bounce back up and basically cover the face. That's fine. That's fine. I, I used to do the same. I just find this easier, so I don't have to hold it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it packs up nice. <laughs> so the, the the stand and everything here is so vint. Is this what year is this? Particular this camera? so this camera's 1930s. 1930s. Yeah. Yeah. Has a mechanical shutter too, pneumatic, you know, blow, blows air in there. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so, we've kind of set everything up for the shot. We don't have to do too much, but, you know, typically when you focus this camera, 
you'll undo this, and then you can, yeah, move it backwards and forwards. And then I use a loop to, to get the fine focus, basically. You see? Right. Oh, yeah, look at that. It's cool, right? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, so I think everything's ready to go here. So the next step in the process is going to be pouring the collodion. Okay, so we, uh, would you like to, yeah, would you like to see inside the dark yeah. box here? You're welcome to come and see. And red light is okay. Oh yeah, red yeah. light's perfectly fine. Without it, you would be stuffed. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I have, um, this is my silver bath here. Um, it looks like an old Civil War one, but it's got an acrylic tank, that's silver nitrate in there. Um, this is where I catch my developer. Um, this is where I stop it, this is just plain water. water. So I'm gonna stop it there. And then once it's stopped, I can bring it outside and fix it. Um, in the tray out there with my fixer. And the case that you put it in? Yeah, so this place. is the case here. Yeah. So this is uh, the case here, so I'll put the film, or the plate, I should say, in there, basically. And uh, I can safely take it to the camera. This is gonna go in the back of the camera. And I'm gonna pull up my slide, take my shot, and uh, safely bring it back here and, and uh, develop rest. it. Yeah. So that's so. No, no, there's nothing in there, um, because once I put that in there, you're not going to be able to see through the glass anymore. It's, it's like a little pocket, you see. You pull that back, and the um, film holder goes in the back of the camera. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to basically use this um, to put the photograph on. So What's this, the very earliest time that photographs were ever made? Um, well, I mean, it depends what you call a photograph, I guess. You know, you had stuff like color types, which were what, in the 18, late 1830s, I guess. You had daguerreotype, um, you know, which was around that time too, Liri Degar. That's something I don't do because it's, you know, too expensive, too dangerous, and those sorts of things. Um, but um, Nieps, I think he took the first photograph. Um, yeah, I'm going to use this one. And I think the first photograph is actually in the University of Texas. Okay, so you see how easy that is? You can, like that, nice clean surface. So now, I may spill some. <laughs> okay, so this is the collodion pour. Pouring a puddle in the middle. Slowly tilting it to each corner. Try not to spill any. You can catch it here. Here we go. It's not a bad pour. You'll smell it in a minute. <laughs> you do this rocking motion while it gets set up. Yeah, it's, it's all muscle memory when it comes down to it. But you poured enough. Okay. Yep, I think it's ready to go. Here's my silver bath. Here's my ladle. So I rest it on here. And plunge it. That's it. Three minutes. <laughs> I'll set my timer now. While we wait. <laughs> While we're waiting there, let me get this focused. Okay. You want maybe turn turn your body a little bit more that direction. Yeah, towards the crowd. That's it. A bit more. So your shoulders so shoulders sort of more in. Yeah. Bit yeah, a little bit more. No, no, this way. That's it, yeah. That's great. Okay, that's perfect. Try, try not to move, keep as still as you can. Okay, it won't take long. <laughs> okay. So 
So you want to use gloves for this particular process because you're going to get silver all over your hands and you know you just get black spots everywhere on your clothes and all your clothes. So always wear out stuff you don't particularly care about. This is my developer here. I made this with vinegar, sugar, ferrous sulfate, a little bit of alcohol. It smells like fish and chips, and I absolutely love it. <laughs> so I use about 40 milliliters on an 8 by 10 plate. And I love this little thing. I use it all the time. And there are other, other recipes for um, developer. You know, you can use uh, glacial acidic acid. Um, but that stuff, once you open up, it stinks, it burns your eyes, I can't stand it. Vinegar definitely is a better pace for me, I think. Okay, so, let's see how much longer we've got. Okay, I'm gonna dive in the box now. Whoops. Moment of truth. Okay, it's looking good. Films in the back of the camera. I'm going to close the shutter. Okay. Pull up the dark slide. The film's now exposed inside the camera. Breath in. Three, two, one. How's that? It's all right. Okay. Do you want to come out? Are you okay? <laughs> Sitting there in the hot seat there. Out before studio lighting, out you'd have to be using natural light. Um, depends on the speed of the lens, um, but you know anywhere from five, ten seconds probably, something like that. But of course, you'd have head stands and things like that to keep yourself still. Beautiful pictures though, and good good results with natural light for sure. Okay, so now I'm going to be developing.
<laughs> okay, folks. A little, little scratch there, a little accident tore the clone in, but. Okay. This is ammonia thiosulfate. Okay, you guys ready for this? <laughs> this is the fixer. This is the fixer. Okay, here we go. Wow. Good job. <laughs> Well, you have to cover the entire plate, basically. It's one time use, you have to get No, I can, I'll be using this all tomorrow. Oh, yeah. you can pour It'll that last. back in and oh, use yeah. it again? Oh, yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, it's strong stuff, yeah. Yeah, probably, I don't know, maybe 25, 30 plates out of it, 8 by 10, I would think, yeah. It's about 1,500 milliliters. Is it different than just like when I was doing regular film photography, there's a fixer at developers that use totally different? They're different chemistries, yeah. yeah. But you can use sodium thiosulfate uh, for this process and you know, use that with printing out paper. So similar, yeah. Do you and have film, a background in chemistry? Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is just stuff I've learned over the last uh, decade, really. Bits and pieces from people, and, you know. But you know, when I first started learning, um, you know, I learned on my own. Um, I took a lot of stuff off the internet, went down a lot of rabbit holes and cost me a lot of money and I didn't get good results and just got kind of you know, upset with it all, but um, I got a book written by um, Quinn Jacobson. He's out in Denver, and that really got me going on the right track. And also, I avoided um, buying pre-mixed chemistry. It was when I actually bought all the components and started learning how this stuff actually works is when I started to get results, you know. Um, I had the chance to shoot uh, Getty Lee from Rush, and Getty um, Lee, really? yeah, oh. and up in Toronto, and unfortunately, I opted to buy premixed oh. chemistry, and nothing worked, and oh. it was just a nightmare, and that was it. <laughs> so, but um, um, probably too old. I don't really have any control over it. You know, when I buy fresh, I, I've got complete control over what I'm doing. You know, otherwise you're at the mercy of whoever mixed it. You know, so. Um, but yeah, but I. Um, I did it for a good couple of years, and then I discovered a guy called John Coffer, who's up in Dundee in the Finger Lakes. And he's kind of like the Yoda of this process. He was the one who sort of brought it back and taught pretty much everyone, I think. I think we're on fourth or fifth generation teachers through him now with this. And um, he put me on the right track, you know, and sort of taught me his way, his methods. Um, and then I spent uh, time with a guy called Ian Ruther, who makes the world's largest wet plates um, out in, um, I did a, a, a thing with him out in um, Palm Springs, and uh, he has this big van, and he makes an enormous place. It takes two people to pour them, and they use basketball, that sort of thing. Um, so I enjoyed that, and then I spent some time with Mark Osterman, and um, Francis' wife up in um, Rochester. Um, he was the archivist, pro uh, the process historian, I should say, at Kodak for many years, like 20, 25 years. So he is, you know, by far, is the most knowledgeable, I would think, of most people in the world of, of all these things. You know, so he taught me how to make negatives. He taught me how to do carbon printing. Uh, so, wow. so yeah. He really has a passion to yeah. do this. I know, I know, I'm crazy, right? <laughs> but um, no, I've taken, I don't even know how many portraits, um, you know, and uh, I've taught a lot of people too. Myself, I do workshops back in New Jersey, have a nice big dark room, and. Uh, you know, I've heard all sorts of people, people with zero experience who just surprised me completely and sent me big plates. I'm like, wow, you really, you're great, you know. I've, I've taught a, a supermodel. Um, I've taught a guy from MIT, and, you know, all sorts of people, you know. So, but yeah, it's amazing. It's, it just draws people from, from everywhere, you know, yeah. Did, before you had, you have a red light to work with in the dark box, but yes. in, in 
old or when they started this, did they have a red light or was it well, they had, by hand? Or? They, um, I think they used um, like Ruby, I think it's called Ruby Lith. It's like a, a gel and they put a candle inside a, a, a thing and uh, if it was outside of, you know, daylight hours. Uh -huh. But um, quite, you know, you can buy sort of historically correct dart boxes pre-made and there'll be Ruby Lith taped right in the back so you can actually look at what you're doing, uh -huh. you know, um, during the daytime. Um, yeah, I, I've, tr I've tried both. It's just that, you know, they've got headlamps. You, wherever you look, you've got a red light. It's fantastic, you know, did, don't have did, to worry. Did some of the older photography, did hmm? teeth not come out that well? Because a lot of pictures, uh, people don't smile. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of speculation on that, I think. Um, but, um, you know, I think because the exposures were a bit longer, people didn't want to smile for that long. Plus, you know. Being Vic, I think Victorian as well, you know, probably, you know. Dental do we want to show there? Oh, dentistry yeah, tape, yeah. that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Sure. There we go. There you go. Look at that shot. <laughs> Wet plate in action. That's all right. There you go. I can see why the steampunk people love you. Oh, yeah. yeah they, they love this. So she had to be completely still for all the time? Well, um, it was literally a split second. Yeah. You know, because I, I, I'm using strobes. Yeah. Um, the only way I can really get repeatable results inside is with strobe. I mean, then I can pretty much guarantee it's going to work most, most of the time. Of course, this process sometimes is just not going to play. You know, things can go wrong. You know, you have to be a good troubleshooter, a good detective. Um, don't change too many things too quickly because you're gonna, you'll never know what it was that does was it, different, you know. Does it start to take the picture before you do the flash? So there's like a little bit of a shadow? Um, it's not that sensitive. <laughs> I mean, it's ISO 3. You, you really can't do any tricks that you can with modern film, really, you know. So you so, open the shutter and then yeah. just flash? Yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, you don't really need a shutter either. I mean, it's so slow. You could pick, pull out the slide and, you know, scratch your head for a bit. <laughs> Boom, you know, you could do that. that. cap over the lens. Yeah, you can that. do that. I use a cap, I use a hat, all, yeah. all sorts of things. But it really is that slow. It's, you know, it's hopelessly slow. <laughs> I was expecting it to be so it's a positive, not a negative. Yeah, well, it is a negative, but it looks like a positive because it's got a black background. If that was on glass, you'd look at, oh, it's, you know, it's like, it's like this, you know, it's, uh, it's a negative. See? But if that was on black, it had a black background, it would seem to be a positive, you know. But that is the yeah. end result. Like that, that is the end result, yeah. That's it, one of one. If you want to make a copy, well, with this, you'd have to scan it and all of that. With the glass, though, that's great because you can make, you can make these. And you can make as many as you like, you know. That's the, I think that's a lot of fun. And there's many processes. You know, this one, this one's called collodion chloride, um, and it is, you know, you're you're mixing collodion, you're mixing um, salts and silver all in the same mixture, and you're pouring on pouring all on the paper, and then you put the paper up to dry, and then it's ready to go. It's light sensitive, and you can get your negative contact print with it, and um, you can get some great results. Um, microscope. Um, I mean, I've... No, I haven't. I know some people try and, you know, they get varying results, you know, from that. Um, but I think it's possible. I know it's someone at Penumbra in New York, they took a picture of the solar eclipse from the street. That was pretty cool. Yeah. So, just, you know, give it a go. <laughs> That's all I can say. You never know. You might, you might get some good results. <laughs> Just ultraviolet, yeah, five, I think, was it 5,000 Kelvin? Yeah. So not, so, the, not the visible light? I no, think. no, well, it's, it's literally just, it's only going to pick up whatever is in that, that spectrum. I think it's 3,500 to 5,000, something like that, yeah. Yeah. So it's not sensitive to red light at all. That's why I can work, obviously work with it, you know. Um. So, Daniel, the, uh, the, the, the plate is wet, and you put it into a plate holder. Yes. Um, no, not, not particularly. Um, you do have to look after your plate holder, though. You have to wipe it clean. Um, silver nitrate is very corrosive, and it, it 
kills cameras and you know plate holders if you're not careful. So um, you know you always want to wipe, wipe it clean. Basically, don't let it hang about silver nitrate. Um, you it know, might but be very delicate as well. Though, like when it's wet. Yeah, I mean you can see I have a little little scratch on here. Right. It can be can it can get scratched. Um, if the variance is inside your um, you know holder are very tight, then yeah, you couldn't. So, so let's just say you're shooting an 11 by 14, okay, and you buy the trophy tin. You have to buy a thicker ga gauge tin because what you'll find is it'll, it'll bow in the middle, and the next thing you know, you pull out dark side, and it's heartbreaking because you've got this fantastic image, and then it scrapes all the clearing off your dark slide. So, you know, you have to buy a thicker gauge to, to do that with, yeah. Glass, I would say, is, is best because it doesn't, it's rigid and it doesn't, it doesn't move, you know, things like that. You know, the, big, the bigger you make, the more problems you get. And that goes for the chemistry too. You know, you may have issues with your chemistry you don't even aware of. You could be happily shooting eight by 10. The moment you try and go up to 11 by 14, 16 by 20, it's gonna magnify and highlight anything that's really wrong with the chemistry. And you know, you've gotta be ready to kind of figure that out and adapt, you know. And stuff like with the, the developer, you know, you can change your uh, recipe. Uh, so for a summer recipe, you know, a hot day, you probably want to have, um, you know, uh, less um, ferrous sulfate, more sugar in my, in my particular choice. And, um, you know, maybe even dilute it with water just so it's not so harsh and it gives you the time and gives you the leeway to actually, you know, develop it the way you want to. So it doesn't just all of a sudden come in and that's it, it's done, done for, you know, within five seconds. You know, you want to you wanna be able to relax and, and do it right. And you know, same goes for you have a cold dark room in the winter, you know, and it's uh, you know below 50, um, then yeah, you're probably going to want to put more ferrous, um, you know, uh, sulfate in the in the mixture so it's stronger. Um, and that's something I learned. But yeah. And the way you stop the development was just by rinsing. Just pure water. Yeah. I mean, in the dark room, you can literally just put it right under the tap and stop it there and then. But I'm in the tray, kind of agitating it and trying to get the all the developer off it. Um, yeah. Uh, which one was that? The fellow with the beard, wasn't he sepia? Oh, yeah, you know what? It's probably because it was a varnished plate, and the varnish kind of gives it that, that look. Yeah. You also lit it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I scanned it on a scanner, so when, you know, once it's varnished, it's going to pick up that tone, basically. Yeah. So that is the wet plate collodion process in a <laughs> nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, <guys. laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>